Welcome to Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, and I'm your host, Eugene Borohovic. In the previous episode, I spoke with Kuldeep Singh Rajput, CEO of Bioformis. Bioformis is not your typical standalone digital therapeutics company, and on the heels of a 300 million round, has evolved to a full data-driven healthcare services organization with a strong foundation of digital therapies driving those care decisions. My guest today is Tim Rudolfi, CEO of Metami Health. Metami, in their own words, believe the best medicine may not be medicine at all. By developing an innovative prescription digital therapeutics to combat many common chronic conditions, they're putting the power to heal right in the hands of their patients, starting with gut health. But before we dive in, I've been in touch with Tim for a number of years now, but finally had the pleasure of meeting in 3D at Met City Invest in Chicago, March of 2022. Tim is an ex-life science executive with a clear vision of growth for Metami Health. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Tim. Tim, welcome to the DTX podcast. For our audience, our listeners, would love to get to know you, who you are, your background, and maybe top it off with a small interesting fact about yourself. Eugene, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Thanks for asking to have us on. You know, from a background perspective, I'm a 30-year pharma background. Been on the commercial side. Most of that time period was with Park Davis before actually getting a chance to start Takeda Pharmaceuticals here in the U.S., So going all the way back to 1999, I think I was one of the first 20, 30 employees at Takeda, helped grow it up to, you know, the 5,000 plus. And over that time, got to the opportunity to run the U.S. business franchise, really running the sales, market access groups, the marketing groups, the business development groups at one point or time or another, and really, really enjoyed that career in pharmaceuticals, but also really enjoyed 1999 when there were 30 of us with just one goal in mind to get the company off the ground. So I wanted to step out and I did that in 2016, got back into the startup world and loved it ever since. You know, it's funny because uh, many entrepreneurs kind of say, well, I'm zero to one or one to 10, but sounds like you're zero to 5,000 employees, which is pretty impressive to say for an entrepreneur. So kudos and congrats on that. That was an interesting fact by itself, but if you have something additional, happy to hear that. Yeah, I guess uh, from an interesting fact that you probably will never have heard from anyone before is, in fun fact, I was thinking about this, it's almost 29 years to the day survived blowing up a gas station. So back in the day before the hose had a breakaway, I pulled off with the pump, which ignited the gas and blew up the entire gas station. But fortunately, no injuries other than obviously the physical property. Wow. Well, that's another, I guess, quote unquote, startup lesson learned on how not to do things, blowing things up, right? So that's kudos to you on that one. So you're the CEO of Metami Health, you know, would love to get to know the, let's call it the founding story and what kind of prompted the company set up and maybe a little bit about the name itself. Yeah. You know, Metami Health was founded back in 2016 by Danny Bernstein. And Danny is still with us. He's our chief product officer. But Danny's a patient first. And that's how this whole journey started. Danny has suffered from IBS and IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome since he was a young kid. He's treated here at Northwestern University in Chicago by some of the world's best physicians in this space. And that's where he learned about behavioral treatments for functional GI disorders or disorders of gut-brain interaction. And Danny's a bit of an entrepreneur, so he's actually started a number of different companies, been in the tech side, and had the idea to take what is being done in the clinic from a behavioral health side, but digitize it. But from a healthcare perspective, didn't really know what to do with it. And that's where Danny and I got connected, given my experience in taking products to market his experience as a patient in understanding what would work and what wouldn't work. And that was in 2016. And here we are today. Amazing journey. And, you know, just like many of the healthcare stories, the typical founders or co-founders and people, you know, we all go through in our care journey or health journey. Not great to hear of the challenges of, of Danny, but great to hear that his passion is what brought the business alive. 
maybe take us through, as you mentioned, 2016, this is, you know, let's call it roughly half a decade into what the DTX industry is even called, the nomenclature, raising funds around it. As you mentioned, you've been around since 2016. At least what I was able to kind of conjure up is, you know, 3.8 million round in 19, another follow on bridge round in 22. But maybe rewind all the way back on the early days of Danny and then the progression to today from a funding perspective and how difficult or, I mean, it's never easy raising funds, no matter what market it is, especially the right funds. Yeah. You know, Eugene, you mentioned it about a half a decade into the DTX space at that time. And the original idea with Meta, me and Danny from Danny was really to take this therapy session and do more of a telemedicine approach. So he worked with behavioral therapists across multiple states and thought about how to scale this. But that's very hard to do. It was hard to do back then. It's still hard to do now, although many companies are getting involved in this space. But that's right when the digital health, digital therapeutics groups started to form. Paratherapeutics eventually came out with their first product. And that's when we said, well, wait a minute, we don't really have to do this in a live format. It would actually be even more convenient for patients, for physicians, for therapists to have this delivery in a full digital format. And that's when we converted about 2017, 18 kind of pivoted from the potential of being a telemedicine organization to what we knew better, which was more of a product service offering. So that's what we did. And and you mentioned the funding. Our first round of funding came in 2019 at 3.8 million. To date, we've only raised 7 million. So we built a product, took it to the FDA, studied it, took it to the FDA, all for limited amount of funds. So it's really been a bootstrapped organization to date. Now, listen, amazing, especially as we've been seeing quite a bit of large funding rounds. And my question is always, where is that all spent? Because I think our biggest limiting resource are the people, the talents, and the brains behind it. As we're educating not just the DTX industry and the surrounding pharmaceutical industry investors, there are people. We're also all patients at some point of the journey of our life, unfortunately. Maybe you can educate us a little bit what your actual product is. I hope I don't butcher it, Regulora. Perfect. Good. Can you please walk us through the user patient experience on it? And also, I found that hypnosis is involved. So maybe I can get a little bit deeper into explaining GHT and expand on that. So the product overview and the underlying thesis, let's call it that way, the scientific thesis behind it. Yeah, I'm going to work that backwards. I'm going to start with why, because it's important to understand Because when you hear about a condition like irritable bowel syndrome, which is symptomatically patients with significant gut pain and some form of bowel dysfunction, like constipation, diarrhea, bloating, you think, well, there must be something wrong with their gut. The truth is in these patients, there isn't. And what is going on and what we do know, though, is there's a disconnect between the brain and the gut. It's called the brain-gut axis. So you've got an enteric nervous system that lines the gut and obviously the central nervous system, which most people are very familiar with, but they don't talk well to each other. The enteric nervous system is hypervigilant and it sends signals that really are more excited than they need to be. And the central nervous system can't downregulate those signals. And you get a cascading series of events then that occur in these patients that result in the symptoms that we described. So come along about 1984 was the first time medical hypnosis, gut-directed hypnotherapy, was studied and shown effective and published in The Lancet. Now, exactly how it works, we still don't really know today, even though there have been 20, 25 different randomized controlled trials showing that gut-directed hypnotherapy has a positive impact on all of the symptoms, the pain, the bloating, the constipation, the diarrhea, it really doesn't matter what level of symptom, the severity or the type, this gut-directed hypnotherapy program has an ability to kind of retrain both nervous systems to work better together, to communicate better. So you're giving the central nervous system an ability to better downregulate the hypervigilant signals that are being sent up from the enteric nervous system. So that's the background on the disease state, right? Now enter 
our solution. So as I mentioned, gut-directed hypnotherapy has been shown effective across 20, 25 randomized controlled trials, all of those though being in person. And what that requires is a 30 to 60 minute session with a therapist in their office once every other week for a 12 week period of time. So there's seven therapy sessions there. That's a lot of commitment, both from the patient as well as the therapist from a scheduling standpoint. We simply took what they're doing in the clinic and created an audio video format of that therapy session. And so our digital therapeutic then provides the patient the ability to schedule these sessions essentially with themselves at any time over the 12 week period of time. And so when you first log in to the program, you'll go ahead and schedule these seven therapy sessions. We actually have built a symptom tracker into the program as well so that patients can and physicians, when they see the report that's provided, understand the severity of the disease when it starts, how adherent patients are to the therapy sessions over the 12-week period of time, and what impact it had, at least as measured by the symptoms reported by the patient over that period of time. You've got all that data now all together in one place. Amazing. And the interesting part is, uh, as we've been looking as an industry, right, lots of cognitive behavioral therapies, now GHT, as you're describing, this is replicating the, let's call it real world interactions between the professionals and the patients. This must be never an easy journey as far as the evidence generation. And maybe uh, you can talk a little bit through the path that you guys have taken with the FDA, some of the discussions and the approvals and the evidence generation. And are those X number of sessions in real world, is that a predicate, right? So can you walk the audience through a little bit of that journey, please? One of the big questions we had, even though there was a significant body of evidence showing that gut-directed hypnotherapy was effective in treating IBS, that was all done in face-to-face therapy sessions, right? And so we didn't know, the big question was, if you remove that interaction, the human interaction, would it still be effective? And that's why we conducted over the course of 2019 and 20, a large randomized controlled trial, 362 patients, one of the largest gut-directed hypnotherapy studies for IBS done to date looking at the effectiveness, and it was completely digital, almost 100% virtual outside of the initial visit with the physician to confirm diagnosis, entry, exclusion criteria, of course, from the study. Outside of that, there was no longer any interaction for the patient outside of interacting with the digital therapeutic itself. And we were very pleased when the results came out showing that, in fact, you can remove that human interaction The gut-directed hypnotherapy as delivered via Regulora is effective at not only treating the pain, but also the bowel dysfunction and other symptoms that these patients have. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with Tim Rodolfi, CEO of Metami Health. Tim, as you're in this commercialization mode now, Just like in any industry, sub-industry product, there's always competition, right? And some on the market already, like Mahana, Bold, and even some over-the-counter products, for lack of a better term, or downloadable by a consumer that maybe don't promise a clinical efficacy, but maybe some of the underlying parameters and quote-unquote active ingredients are the same as well. How are you looking at the market and your own differentiation as you're entering this commercialization phase? It's an interesting question because it's easy to immediately look and see these other companies, these other offerings as competition and start to think, how can we beat them? In this case, early on in this industry, I see it completely differently. I'm Mahana's biggest fan. I want them to succeed. And I think they think the same thing about us, honestly, because the more success we have at educating the healthcare ecosystem, patients, that prescription digital therapeutics are effective, proven therapies that have a place in healthcare, the more we can show that behavioral treatments, whether it's gut-directed hypnotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, is effective in treating patients with IBS and other functional GI conditions, the better we'll all be. The more options these patients will have, the more top of mind it will be for physicians to be able to prescribe to these patients, payers will reimburse, 
and there's economic benefit to the entire system. So I'm hopeful that not only Mahana succeeds, MetaMe Health succeeds, but then we bring in other entrepreneurs into this space to eventually make digital therapeutics just healthcare. You know, it's no longer digital health, it's just health. It's just another modality of a therapeutic. We kind of talked about that in season one with some of the players, including Brian Dolan. With every business, as you get moving and going, there's a hypothesis that you either prove or disprove as quickly as possible. Again, as I mentioned in the earlier question around downloadable, non-prescription cognitive behavioral therapies and other things, did you guys set off thinking this will have to be a prescription in your mind, and that's the commercialization model or not? And what was that business hypothesis that you can talk to? And including, would love to hear even some pricing as you're thinking entering the market to the extent that you can and comfortable with it. Yeah. The first part of that's a really interesting question. And we did spend a significant amount of time thinking about it. With my background, having been in the GI space for years and having had the opportunity to work with GI physicians and patients, I understood that the IBS patient in particular is a very frustrated patient population. It's difficult for them to get a diagnosis. There's all kinds of commentary about, well, it's just all in your head or it's not a real problem for you. Well, it is a real problem for these patients and they do really suffer. And the relationship they have with their physician is very important to them. It's very important for the condition to be validated, that it is a real medical condition that has real solutions. So I think having an FDA cleared prescription digital therapeutic that physicians are comfortable in understanding and prescribing and explaining to their patients is very important. Beyond that, it was very important for us as a company to go through the FDA process because we want to ensure that these patients are being seen by a physician and are being properly diagnosed. The symptoms of IBS can be similar to symptoms of other more serious conditions like colon cancer or IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. Now those conditions with delayed treatment can have serious impact to the patient's lives. And we don't want any part of delaying the appropriate treatment for patients. We wanna make sure they are appropriately diagnosed that Regulora is an appropriate product for them potentially, and if not, then find one that is. So I think that's very important. And it's a concern for me, looking at the industry as a whole in the healthcare system, to see some of these other products without FDA prescription authority, making claims sometimes, stretching a little bit. And the risk that that can have to patients' lives, I don't know, it concerns me. Now, listen, very fair point. And I think just like in many cases, it depends on the therapeutic area. It depends on the complexity of the patient. And so again, the indication that you guys have going after, and maybe before we sort of dive in a little bit deeper, actually, can you talk, since we're still talking a bit about the evidence components of this, any other things in the pipeline? I mean, uh, given that your background is pharma, pipeline, pipeline, pipeline is what many investors ask. Can you chat about that? Yeah. You know, it's funny. You're right. In the pharma side, it's pipeline, pipeline, pipeline. On the digital side, it seems we're liking to use the word platform, platform, platform. And in our case, it's either one will work. And we do. We actually have two other products in our pipeline utilizing the same concept of delivering gut-directed hypnotherapy that's different than the existing Regulora gut-directed hypnotherapy it's for different functional areas. So we've got uh, functional heartburn and actually ulcerative colitis. And we're in pilot trials have shown that both of these GDH protocols have been successful. And we're now preparing to be able to take these into larger randomized control trials, eventually then for FDA filing. Beyond that, Right now, we're focused on, and we will be for the next three to five years, on disorders of brain-gut interaction, GI functional conditions. But if you look at the opportunity to utilize medical hypnosis in a digital format, boy, there are a lot of opportunities out there because there's evidence showing that medical hypnosis has been effective in areas like fibromyalgia or cancer pain or obesity, smoking cessation, non-cardiac chest pain. I mean, the list kind of goes on and on. But again, the problem is, where am I supposed to get that therapy? Who's delivering it? 
in a proven manner. We think we're going to build the expertise and the platform to be able to expand into those areas. Well, that sound means it's time for a question from my clinical and commercial partner on this podcast, Chandana Fitzgerald, who is the Chief Medical Officer and General Manager of Health Excel, and as her friends call her, Dr. No Crack. Let's see what question Chandana has for our guest today. Hi, Tim. My question for you is, how should one sell a prescription digital therapeutic to a doctor? So can you describe the field for a PDT? especially given your background heading up pharma sales prior to joining MetaMe? I'll tell you, that's a really interesting uh, question, Chandana. I appreciate you asking it. And I will tell you, three, four years ago when I started this journey, I thought for sure this would be a traditional 150, 200 person sales force on the ground, knocking on the doors of physicians across the United States. But Over the course of the last three to four years, I've really started to shift my thinking. I think there's a role for that, but I think the approach of directly to patients in this case and actually reaching out to physicians in a digital fashion, just like our product is, I think could be just as effective. So our go-to-market strategy is actually going to be a digital first one, both to patients and physicians. Eventually, we likely will bring on a sales force. But we'll bring that sales force on over time as our reimbursement coverage expands across the United States, where we can take greater advantage in local geographic areas versus a more traditional pharma approach of covering all of the United States with a one to 500 person sales force. And I'm going to hop in here. You know, recently you guys struck a deal with Indigene, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It seems like a commercialization type of deal where you guys are very much focused on, let's call it R&D and bring the products through the FDA process. That's kind of my perception. Maybe you can talk a little bit more. And that's why probably you alluded to Chandana about the sales force or quote unquote lack of a large sales force build out. But can you please expand on the Indigene deal? That's exactly right, Eugene. You know, if you take a look at Indigene, and that's pronounced correctly, right? They're a a healthcare services provider and, you know, over the last 20 years have really built a name for themselves and a database of understanding physicians in the healthcare system and their digital affinity. So not only do we know which physicians are active in treating and utilizing certain patients in certain disease states, But the Indigene AI machine actually understands how physicians like to receive digital information, whether that be off the website, webinars, podcasts, emails. And that's how we're going to use their technology to reach out to physicians in this digital first manner in our initial phase of our launch. There are always decisions to be made, uh, you know, by entrepreneurs and the executive teams as far as channels. And would love for you to describe to our audience, what are you seeing? I mean, you know, many DTXs go into the self-insured employer. You know, obviously you guys are PDT, a prescription product. So that does need to be prescribed. Are you trying to sell through the hospitals as well? I mean, I know you alluded to digital channels, more direct to consumer, but curious what you're already seeing in the earlier days as you're getting the commercialization engine moving and what's working and what's not. I'll tell you one thing I've learned over the years In the digital therapeutics space, if you think you have the answer, you're probably setting yourself up for a problem. We fully recognize this is an evolving industry. The healthcare system hasn't quite figured out how to do this. And so we're going to remain flexible. We have ideas. We have approaches. We're looking at historically what we think could work. And we'll take lessons learned from that and move forward but always remaining flexible to see what others are doing and what seems to be working. And you said it earlier, Eugene, it really does depend. In our case, in the GI space, hospitals, provider systems, they really don't have an interest in IBS. There's really not a play there, at least that we've been able to find yet. It really is a play where the pain point today is with the GI physician and the patient. And what we're trying to do is find out, I think successfully, where that pain point is and then try to resolve it. And so we'll go 
to the patient and to the physician first. But again, we'll remain flexible to see where other opportunities might arise as well. Thank you for that. And this is always a more of a selfish question from your coach health perspective. And I just looked before we were recording this out of the thousands of coaches we have on a little over 400 are self-identifying as gut health coaches. And I'm curious, you know, as we digitize some of these experiences, what we're finding is that people still need human beings to lean on. I'm curious how you guys are looking at that human being. Uh, you know, we know the doctor needs to do the prescription and there is some support on it. How you guys are looking at coaches in your world? I agree completely with you that the health coach, particularly in the GI space, can play a significant role and really bring an advantage to the patients and to the physicians in this space. Right now, as we look at our go-to-market strategy, it's not a core strength of ours. We think there are other groups that do a much better job, have the infrastructure built, yourself included, and you can provide those solutions. They can provide those solutions. We don't need to recreate that wheel. If we did, it would just be an added layer for us. We'd have to learn how to do it when, again, others have already figured that out. We'll rely on other areas to be able to provide that service, and we're going to stay very focused on providing the product. We always say everybody needs to do what they're best at doing, right? Tim, and the next one here is, and we purposely leave this kind of broad, what advice would you give to an entrepreneur getting into the DTX space, given the years of experience, especially also the 30 years in pharma and going to market and commercializing things? I think for me, boy, I'll tell you, I'm sure like every entrepreneur, it's a roller coaster. You've got great days, great months, great years, and then you've got bad days, months, and years. And it would be easy to give up. And the advice I would give here is just don't give up. You've got to stay focused and on your goal and what's important to the organization and what's important to you. And if you stay focused and don't give up, you'll get through those downtimes. I don't know if you've ever seen that cartoon, and this is not an R-rated podcast, but it goes, there's the F word 27 times in a row, and then there's oh yay, and then there's an F word again 37 times in a row, and there's a yay, and that's what I think you're describing. So, you know, kind of follow through the F words and stick to the yays and persevere. Oh, I've not seen it, but I'm laughing inside. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. We started with you and an interesting fact, which uh, I think there's always a first. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a guest blowing up a gas station, so you win the prize for that. But we also want to end with you. What makes you really get up in the morning? Uh, I hope this comes out the right way, but it's everyone who says no to me. I keep a list and, and someday, you know, <laughs> we're going to show them that you made a mistake. You shouldn't have said no. And this actually goes back to your advice as well, thick skin and persevering through, you know, to me, I try to, and, you know, to the listeners that are listening, I try to close the loop 999999 times out of whatever the, you know, with the zeros on top. And that to me is usually the most frustrating part. It's so easy to just say no. And we have a mantra here at your coach. Yes, yes, no, no, maybe is a no, whether it's the prospect, the client or the other side, just close the loop. So... Anyway, I'm glad we think alike. Tim, thank you very much. This was a pleasure and i um, looking forward to catching up with you for some updates potentially next year, if not before. Absolutely. It was a ton of fun. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks. Thanks for tuning into the Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, a production of mission-based media. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player so you're automatically notified each time I speak with one of these amazing leaders and trailblazers who are forging the path for digital therapeutics. If you'd like to learn more about Your Coach Health or Health Excel, you can find the links to this and more in the show notes for this episode. I'm Eugene Borohovich, and catch you next time.